Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I still see people coming. Uh, so uh, please take your seats. I think we have a real full house today, and that's great to see. Uh, and the, uh, the topic of the talk is so fascinating, and I'm sure the talk itself will be. So uh, it's great to see so many of you and from physics backgrounds in class, in high school, in college, and so on, I believe. Uh, so uh, very glad that you could make it to ICTS. Uh, I will, um, before, the, uh, before the main talk, I, I will uh, just give you a very short overview of what ICTS is. Uh, maybe many of you have not been here before uh, or haven't heard of ICTS before, so I'll just give you a, a bird's eye view of it. Um, so, um, so the ICTS campus is something that uh, 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 was actually conceived not very long ago. In 2012 is when the uh, construction began based on the architect's plans. Uh, but uh, uh, by 2015, actually, we had moved into campus. And by 2017 end, uh, it, uh, it had taken the shape that you all uh, see it now. We have a residential campus which has, uh, 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 which is fairly self-contained. It has uh, the academic block, of course, but also residential and uh, the guest house and the seminar complex that you are currently in. Uh, uh, we have a very nice library building. If you get a chance, you should see that a computer center, guest house. Uh, and so on. So, uh, so these are just glimpses uh, of uh, uh, of our infrastructure. But uh, uh, beyond the brick and mortar, what ICTS is is a, a fairly unique kind of an institution which brings together three different uh, uh, three different uh, parts of um, uh, of its mission. Uh, so these three things, which I will tell you a little bit about, uh, are uh, what we call programs, uh, our research and outreach. Uh, so uh, in many ways, we are modeled after uh, peer institutions elsewhere, like the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, uh, Newton Institute in Cambridge, ICTP in Trieste, and the IAS in Princeton, and so on, but with quite significant innovations, especially for the Indian context, uh, which is what I think makes it unique. and. Uh, uh, and has holds out a lot of possibility for uh, Indian science. Uh, so w what do I mean by this sort of three uh, interwoven pieces of the mandate? Uh, uh, so our research, of, and I'll tell you a little bit, is, uh, is at, the, uh, 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 at the frontier of world science in theoretical physics, in uh, mathematics, uh, quantitative biology and uh, uh, and in going forward uh, a theoretical computer science etc uh, we uh, we have a graduate program uh, we don't have undergraduates but we ha have a integrated PhD and a PhD program. Uh, so, but that's more conventional and a lot of research institutes in India uh, have that. But what's unique is that together with this, we tie up with, uh, we have tied up uh, the, uh, the mission of uh, conducting collaborative workshops or programs which can range from a week or two weeks to several months even. And uh, Professor Abanov is here for one such program, uh, uh, which has currently been running. Uh, it's actually a month-long program on integrable systems. Uh, so that uh, brought together people from physics, mathematics, and diverse areas of physics and mathematics as well uh, to come together to, to both uh, work together, discuss and exchange ideas, but also to give uh, pedagogical lectures to train our future researchers in India. Uh, uh, so that's one of the things that our programs do. Uh, and, um, and tied to that are our outreach events like today's and many more that we conduct. And, uh, and you can see how the program visitors uh, uh, are tied in with our research since we get 
uh, so many wonderful scientists from around the world, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we feel that something then, uh, many of them are excellent communicators and we uh, would like to share them with the uh, young people of the city and enthuse them uh, about science. Uh, so, so this is how they are uh, interwoven. Our researchers themselves play a very active role uh, in organizing these programs. Uh, so, so it's all, uh, it's tied up very closely. Uh, so in terms of our research, uh, we have uh, a world-class faculty in uh, several areas in physics, uh, as I said, mathematics, etc. Uh, more specifically, we have a group in the gravitational waves, which was part of the LIGO collaboration, and uh, we have uh, group, uh, groups in string theory, which work on topics of black holes and uh, quantum gravity, people in statistical mechanics and condensed matter physics, uh, uh, and, and that's one, um, and many of them, uh, many of the people in the integrable systems workshop are in this, uh, in these, in these domains, uh, biophysics and soft matter, fluid dynamics where uh, people work on fundamental problems like turbulence, but also problems, uh, uh, scientifically challenging problems like understanding the Indian monsoon, which uh, you can all appreciate its importance. And uh, finally, mathematics in a variety of different areas, ranging from uh, probability theory, uh, big data, uh, uh, partial differential equations, and uh, the relation between geometry and physics, which is again a theme of today's talk. Uh, so this was some uh, publicity that ICT has uh, got uh, thanks to uh, the very important uh, contributions that our uh, LIGO group made in the, uh, in the analysis of the LIGO discovery. Uh, um, our programs uh, are, as I said, collaborative workshops, but we try to have them in areas which uh, uh, which are uh, which can which are new initiatives, new directions, which are probably not represented very well in India, uh, not necessarily, but very often that's the case. Uh, but more generally, it's a place for researchers to uh, come together and and not in a conference-like format, which is usually m uh, not particularly conducive to people starting collaborations or. Uh, or are working out uh, new ideas, but workshops like ours are, and they, we also uh, uh, hope that by bringing together uh, um, a lot of excellent scientists from across various disciplines, uh, they can chart out roadmaps and new directions uh, as well, and sometimes we've had programs uh, which have done that in a variety of uh, different areas. And more generally, we would like, at least in uh, some of our programs, to con connect scientists with engineers and industry uh, and, uh, and strengthen the channels between uh, fundamental science and engineering and industry, uh, which is missing in our country. Uh, in terms of numbers, we've had a large number of programs, uh, uh, especially since moving to our campus. This is a cumulative figure. Uh, uh, 127 programs and 54 discussion meetings, which are shorter uh, uh, for just a week or so. You can see a large number of participants and a very large component from abroad. Uh, uh, and uh, all the talks in these meetings, and many of them are pedagogical, are all archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, um, there are many special lecture series that we conduct, the Chandrasekhar lecture series in physical sciences, Ramanujan in maths, maths and Turing in biology and computer science. In addition, there are other named lecture series like the Abdus Salam lecture series and the uh, ICTS distinguished lectures. Uh, our 2018 calendar is full and uh, uh, actually much of 2019 already uh, is uh, uh, chock full with programs. So, uh, so there's a large demand and it's driven by the science community because anyone from the scientific community can uh, put in a proposal for programs at ICTS uh, and uh, we in that sense function like a hub or a node for the entire scientific community, at least in these areas of uh, physics, mathematics, and, and so on. 
and these are some uh, uh, a sampling of various program titles. They have gone, and they are, as I said, in mathematics, in geometry, but cosmology at the very big scales, uh, matter uh, in different states of matter, uh, 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 string theory, nanoscale physics, and the theory, theory in biology, which is something that uh, uh, we we have had a number of uh, we have a regular school on uh, quantitative biology in collaboration with the ICTP in Trieste, uh, etc. So that's about our programs. And finally, the third prong of our mandate was outreach, and we've had a number of public lectures by very eminent scientists, and, uh, and today's is a, a, a such a public lecture. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, all our talks are on YouTube. This is the channel, so if you have not seen our YouTube channel, if you look at this you, uh, channel, just type in ICTS Talks. You will find a, find a lot of uh, very exciting uh, lectures over there. Uh, it has had more than 1.3 million views, and I think this is now outdated. Every time this number keeps, uh, now it's close to 15,000 subscribers, I think. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so this, um, uh, and we are active on social media and so on. Uh, uh, we have other outreach activities like the Einstein lectures where we partner with institutions around the country uh, and, um, uh, uh, and have speakers from ICTS or visitors to ICTS visiting uh, as the many smaller institutions. Uh, the uh, Mathematics of Planet Earth was a very special event we held uh, uh, with an exhibition at the Vishweshwara Museum had 32,000 attendees, and it was a very successful maths outreach initiative. Uh, uh, and we are planning in this coming year to uh, ICTS is spearheading a, a, a Bangalore Science Hubba, uh, or BASH as we call it. Uh, uh, so please be tuned for that. We are planning a kickoff event in January 2019 it, uh, with a year-long set of events uh, and culminating somewhere in the latter part of the year, somewhere around October, November 2019, uh, uh, which will be, the culmination will be um, science fair. It will be like a science festival uh, with several venues, a lot of exciting uh, events, exhibits, activities. Uh, uh, so, uh, so stay tuned, and I think it'll be a it'll be a very exciting uh, event, uh, and uh, uh, and it will uh, uh, and you will hear about it. Uh, so, um, uh, so these are snapshots from our uh, 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 from our outreach events. Uh, finally, I just want to mention Copy with Curiosity, which is a monthly lecture series we hold at the planetarium. Uh, it, it consists of a talk plus a lot of question and answer, uh, and has, again, scientists from Bangalore as well as program visitors. And it's been very successful. I don't know how many of you, how many of you have come for any of the Copy with Curiosity? Uh, okay, a small fraction, but okay, non-negligible. Uh, uh, so, but uh, please uh, look at our Facebook or uh, uh, our um, web page uh, for announcements for these Copy with Curiosity events. I assure you, they are they are usually really stimulating, uh, and uh, the speakers are uh, are wonderful. Uh, again, there are often demonstrations and other things in the uh, in the uh, event. Um, uh, it's held every month. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, this month it will be on the 19th, that is next Sunday, and it will be Arvind Gupta, maybe some of you have heard, who is, uh, who is very famous and got Padma Shri this year for uh, making science demonstrations out of uh, very everyday stuff. In fact, he has a website called I think uh, science from trash or something like that. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so it will. He's a fascinating um, educator of science, uh, and uh, so I would encourage you to come to the planetarium on the 19th at 4 p.m. for his talk. Uh, so this is uh, something we, uh, which is now one of our flagship uh, outreach events. We also had very special ones for our 10th anniversary. Maybe some of you came for the Kip Thorn lecture that was held in the foyer outside. 
uh, uh, but we had also public lectures, panel discussions at that time. So, um, so that just to give you a glimpse, I think I maybe took already a lot of time uh, away. Uh, but uh, now let me invite, uh, before I invite Professor Francini uh, to introduce the speaker, on behalf of ICTS, I'd like to present a memento to Professor Abanov for kindly agreeing to, uh, uh, to give this public lecture because it's always a very non-trivial task and, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, so, uh, but uh, let me now invite Professor Fabio Francini, who, who will introduce the speaker to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Ale Sasha Alexander Abanov to you. He's a faculty at, Con at Stony Brook University and the deputy director of the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics. Uh, he graduated from Moscow Institute of Technology, uh, mostly working at the Landau Institute, and has always been a stellar student, one of uh, the best, which should serve as an inspiration. Also because he was not definitely the loner type, as far as I understand. He's a very interesting guy with diverse interests and always good spirited. Um, after uh, Moscow, he moved to Chicago, he got his PhD there, then he moved to a prestigious MIT in Boston before moving to uh, Stony Brook. I think that one of his greatest achievements was to bring me uh, to graduation, and then he perfected uh, the task with Manas Kulkarni, who is now a faculty here, and with that I think I leave it uh, to him. Okay, let me start by thanking Fabio for the introduction and for, for the organizers here to, who brought me here. I'm very honored and very excited to give this talk. This is the first time I give this talk in this particular combination. I get, have different pieces of this talk delivered somewhere, but, but all together it's a new thing and I hope the whole will be bigger than the, some of the parts. So we'll see. Okay, so everything works. Uh, so the talk will be about uh, common things between falling cats and quantum Hall effect. And the main theme of this talk will be emergence of geometry and topology in physics. And I will try to explain everything here, all terms here except for physics. So I will explain what emergency geometry and topology are, and at least how I should understand that for this particular talk. And this is how I'm going to do that. I'm going to first talk, say a few words about emergence. Then we will do some demonstrations of which illustrate how this emergence can happen in physics. And we talk about geometry and topology and some uh, slightly more modern definitions that you find in high school of geometry. And then we will talk about how cats land on their feet when they are dropped off or fall, and, and then we will see is there anything in common with, of this with quantum Hall effect. So let's, let's start. So let me start with the quote from uh, one of the most uh, interesting and fascinating characters in physics, Richard Feynman, who is uh, this year we celebrate 100 years since his birth. And he was explaining about heat and cold, and in particular he was talking what's difficult for many people in science. So let me read the quote. I think that one of the things that make it, it science difficult is that it takes a lot of imagination. It is very hard to imagine all the crazy things that things really are like. Uh, nothing is really as it seems. We are used to getting hot and cold, and all that is the speeds of the atoms are jiggling. If they jiggle more, it corresponds to the hotter, and colder is jiggling less. So, this is one example of emergence, so that what we see and what we feel is not necessarily what is going on. And the, in philosophy, system theory, science and art, emergence occurs when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, meaning the whole has properties that parts do not have. So this is very general, it will take us too far. But in physics it's a bit more precise. Emergence is used to describe a property law or phenomenon which occurs at macroscopic scales in space or time, but not at microscopic scales, despite the fact that actually microscopic system can be viewed as a very large ensemble of microscopic systems. So something new that we have at, on a big scale. 
for example, as uh, the same example that I showed in the last slide, is that the temperature is a property of macroscopic system. You cannot say what the temperature of individual molecule is, but the feeling of hot and cold appears as a result of averaging over fast motion of individual molecules. So this averaging over fast motion is one of the mechanisms of, of emergence in physics, and we will talk about this a bit more. And first we will start with a demo which will show you some averaging of a fast motion and what it can do. So, yes. So safety comes first. So. Okay. okay. This is a jigsaw. So basically what we see here is a pendulum, just regular pendulum. Okay. This pendulum, as you know, has two equilibrium positions. One is stable equilibrium positions uh, in, in its regular position, and another is upside down, which is also equilibrium position, but not stable, as you can see. So the question uh, occurs is, what happens if I will start vibrating the, the pivot point of the pendulum with very big frequency of up and down? This is what this jigsaw is doing. So any guesses? Do you know what it is? So what happens with pendulum if I start vibrating it like this? So let me start with some low setting, number two. So you already noticed probably something, but let me to make it more pronounced, put higher setting to vibrate it with even higher frequency, then this is what we have. So as you can see, the upside down position of pendulum, which used to be unstable, now becomes stable uh, as a result of averaging over fast motion in vertical direction. I can even do this kind of stuff. Okay. So this phenomenon is known as Kapitza pendulum, and I'm going to explain how it works in a second, but the main lesson is that this is some averaging of fast motion. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. This is schematic illustration of Kapitza pendulum. By the way, many images are taken from Wikipedia, which should be credited. I credited on some, but not on all of them. And this is the uh, photo of Pyotr Kapitza. So the pendulum actually was first described by Stephenson in 1908, as early as 1908, but explained only in 1951 by Pyotr Kapitza, who is quite famous Russian physicist. Uh, who is Nobel Prize winner for the discovery of superfluidity of helium. Uh, here you might think that he looks like British, and this is not accidental because he worked in Rutherford Laboratory in Cambridge for a long time. Okay, so, so Kapitza basically wrote a paper in 1951 explaining how all these things work. So let me try to follow the logic. This is qualitative explanation. You can do much more detailed series and so on and so forth. So let's consider the pendulum. And the point, uh, or the pivot point, is, is vibrating up and down. And I just uh, draw here two positions of pendulum. One when it's more or less horizontal, and one when pendulum forms the angle alpha with vertical, which is smaller than 90 degrees. So we vibrate pendulum this way, or we vibrate this pendulum this way, and we ask what's different between this position and this position, how forces work. It's kind of inconvenient to, to think about uh, vibrational uh, vibration of the pivot point and then rotation around it. So it's much easier to go to accelerated reference frame of the pivot point. So let me go to frame which goes up and down, so then this point will be not moving and the pendulum will be vibrating. Okay? So let's do that. This is the picture that we obtain. So remember that the, there was this upper position, I call it number one, and at upper position the pivot point actually goes down, so acceleration is down, so the force acting on the pendulum should be, should be directed up. Okay, I, okay. So the force on the, on the, in this position one should be directed up, and if, if the pivot point in the position two, then the, the uh, inertia force is, is looking down, so this is the, how it looks like. So when pendulum vibrates between these positions, the average momentum, uh, the average torque created by these forces is zero. 
right? So basically, in this position, these vibrations do not add anything new, and, 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 and for now, we forget about gravity force. We will add it later. What about this situation, when the angle was smaller than 90 degrees? Then again, I draw the forces, and I see that in position one, the uh, inertial force is actually pointing up, and in position two is down. But now, although forces are the same, because they're related to acceleration of the, of the point, the, the arms of those forces are different. So the torque created by force F1 is bigger than the force created by the force F2. So when you average between these positions, the overall torque will be trying to put the pendulum upside down. Of course, if you do it slowly, then gravity will, will overcome it, but if the frequency of vibration is fast enough, then the overall, moment, overall torque will, will put, put pendulum in the upside down position and it will get stable. Okay? This is the main mechanism for the pizza pendulum, so average torque tries to rotate the pendulum counterclockwise in this picture to orient it upside down. This is the qualitative explanation. You can put some formulas, write the for small angle to write the, the uh, angular momentum of the gravity, angular momentum of this inertial force averaged over vibrations, and you find the following condition for stability of upside-down uh, position of the pendulum. Namely, if frequency of, of vibration is large enough or amplitude of vibration is large enough, bigger than this 2GL, where L is the length of the pendulum, that the pendulum will be stable in upside-down position. So, actually, you can even think about some more physical meaning of this. Do you remember the 2GL formula from your physics classes? What is given by 2GL? So if I take some object and drop it from the height L, this will be exactly the square of velocity of this object when it falls onto the floor, right? So this is the velocity of the object which would fall from the height of the pendulum, and this is basically the velocity squared of, of the pivot point. So as soon as this velocity is bigger than this, uh, you, will, you will see upside down position stable. Okay? So if you put some numbers which are typical for this jigsaw chain, you will see that the length of the pendulum should be about seven centimeters so that it works. As you can see in the, our demo, the pendulum was bigger and that's a little bit of cheating because the actual pendulum, the small metal stick, heavy stick was, was this short, but, but uh, the rise attached here, the, the foam, uh, stick, which is very light, which does not change effective length of the pendulum, so that you can see it better. Okay. Okay. So this is the main formula. This is the main condition of stability of the pendulum. And if the frequency is large, in uh, larger than the length of the pendulum, essentially, then the upside position is stable. So now, now let's try to take a limit. Let's try to take a limit when the frequency is huge, and the amplitude is really, really small, but frequency is really, really huge then you would not see the vibration, right? Because it's, it will be so fast that you will actually don't see it. But if the product is still bigger than, than this quantity, you will see that this pendulum behaves in a very weird way. It's stable upside down. And this is what I wanted to illustrate, that, that we do not see oscillations, uh, but instead we see extremely weird behavior as the pendulum is oscillating in the upside down orientation. And this is the example of one of the mechanisms of emergence. Usually in emergence, we have a lot of particles here, we just have a few degrees of freedom, but even here, the averaging of a fast microscopic motion of the pivot point of the panel changes completely the, the physics of the pendulum. It makes it stable upside down. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay. If there are no questions, we go to demo two. And I will need volunteer to help think whether you can do that. Okay. Uh, so, this is actually one of these, uh, it's not science from trash, but science from some household objects. So you can, you can do it yourself easily. I did it many, many times at home. So any volunteer? Yeah, please. Okay. Come to the stage. First I will show some experience and then I will uh, ask a volunteer to help with, yeah, please, you can, you can go there. Okay, first of all, this is like regular bicycle reel. You can do it even without handles, but, but the guys here are, are very uh, crafty and they attach nice uh, handles here so that you can hold it nicely. And if I let it go, then it just behaves as like a regular object, right? It just falls. So now, can you hold it like this? And, and, yeah. 
Okay, now let's go, please. As you can see, behavior is totally different from what it used to be. So the bicycle wheel does not fall. Instead, it, it, it precesses horizontally, the horizontal direction. Okay? So this is quite, quite interesting. But even more interesting, even more interesting is actually to feel what's going on. Could you hold really tight so that I can rotate it quickly? And now hold it not so tight and try to do like this. Yeah, try, try to just change direction in some particular way. So what do you feel? It's pushing away from where I'm trying to be. Yeah, could, yeah, can you break it? So if you're trying to push it this way, what, what does it do? It starts to move this way. So what it happens actually is that if you try to push it this way, it tries to rotate, as we see uh, with, with, with a string example, right? So if you have it like this, then it actually tries to fall, but because of the rotation, it, instead of falling, it, it, it goes in a perpendicular direction. This is very counterintuitive behavior. So if you're trying to do something with it, it's always trying to push in, in perpendicular direction. It's really, uh, everyone should try this once in life, at least. Oh. OK, one more time. OK, just try to feel exactly where it goes. If you're trying to rotate it this way, what does it do? It moves according to its strength. This yeah, OK. OK. Thank you very much. So what is your name? Suraj. Suraj. Thank you very much, Suraj. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so this was another demonstration. Uh, so let me first explain how Jaro works, and then, then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, make some philosophical conclusion out of it. So this is gyroscope. So this is the heavy wheel which rotates in this direction. And there is a weight which tries to pull it down. Okay? But it's on support, so it can rotate around this axis, like this. And weight tries to pull it down, so if it were not rotating, it would just fall. Right? However, gyroscope is not falling down, but instead precessing horizontally, as we just saw. So the question is why? And uh, to explain this, let me introduce you concepts, although, as I was told, you probably already know all of that, so we will go relatively fast. So suppose that you have a door. This is a door. Uh, the view from the top, and this is hinge, so it can rotate around the hinge. Okay, and let me ask you, what is the easiest way to open the door? To apply force at point A, at point B, or at point C in the direction C? So, who is thinking that C is the best? Could you raise your hand? Okay, A, B. Okay, so you know you know your stuff. Good. Good. And the question is why? And the answer is that actually for rotational motion, this is not force that is important, but the torque. And torque is given by force multiplied by the moment arm. And in case of B, the moment arm is just the length of the, of the door. In A, just this distance. And in C, it's zero, because if you continue the line of the force, the, the, the distance between the hinge, between rotation point and the vector uh, uh, line C will be zero. So there is this inequality, and therefore the way B is much easier than the way A, and it's impossible to open the door doing C. Okay? You have to also remember that torque is actually a vector, and you should use right-hand rule to, to find the direction of the torque. In particular, in this case, if, if I apply force B, what will be the direction of the torque? So, so first of all, it should be perpendicular to both radius vector from this point and the force itself, and then the right-hand rule allows us to determine the direction, and it will be out of the screen, right? OK. So now, next step is suppose that you have these three doors, oh, very schematically. So the same mass, the same length, but they, the mass is distributed differently, OK? And I ask, what's the, which door will be easiest to open? Suppose that I apply the same force here, which one will be easier to open? So A. B and C. Okay, there are some people who think that C. Okay, so the answer is that uh, it all depends on angular momentum. So you, you apply the same torque, but, but it's the change of angular momentum, which is important. And angular momentum is momentum times the moment arm again. The moment arm is, is uh, sort of looks the same, but not quite, because the, the main mass is right here. So the distance from 
from this point to the, the concentration of the mass is more or less the length of the door, and here the mass is here, so the moment arm is much smaller here. So therefore, the angular momentum of the door B at the same angular velocity will be much smaller than the rest of them, and therefore it will be easier to open. Okay? So the right answer is B. Okay? And again, the angular momentum uh, direction should be determined using right-hand rule. Okay? okay, so now we go back to, to gyroscope, and we are trying to do the following. So these are the forces. There is a weight, there is a normal force from the support. Suppose that they are the same, they will become the same in a second. Uh, when, when you just start mo mo moving, uh, and therefore there is the, the net force is zero, so actually it doesn't fall. Uh, so, but if I take this point and calculate the torque of the force W relative to this point, what will be the direction of the torque? According to the right-hand rule, you should just rotate like this, and it will be in the direction of the screen, direction tau. This is torque. Okay. So, on the other hand, it rotates this way. So, what will be the direction of angular momentum? According to the right-hand rule, it will be direction of this vector L. So, this L is angular momentum of the gyroscope. This is the direction of the torque. The rate of the angular momentum change is the torque. So, basically, it means that this vector L will try to rotate towards the torque, but because it's attached to a gyroscope, the gyroscope will rotate in that direction. And that's precisely what we saw. If you play with this bicycle wheel, we, we will see that it exactly rotates in the, in the direction predicted by this type of arguments. Okay. Any questions? So L rotates in the direction of the torque, and that gives you the direction of rotation of the gyroscope. Okay, so we now make some conclusions. Imagine that we have a gyroscope that rotates so fast that we do not see its rotation, or it is just hidden from us. Actually, the most impressive experiment I saw was when this gyroscope was inside some box. Then you really don't see anything rotating. You take the box, you try to, to, to change its orientation, and it goes perpendicular direction. It's kind of almost like a life. So suppose we don't see rotation of the gyroscope, or it rotates so fast that we just don't notice its rotation. And we see extremely weird behavior. The axis of the gyro is moving in the direction perpendicular to the applied force. Not in the direction, in the direction of the torque, but, but not, uh, not the force. And, and we again say that averaging of a fast rotational, in this case, motion, leads to very unusual, unusual emergent behavior, the behavior of this gyroscope. Okay? Any questions? So we touched a little bit on the concept of emergence, and now we are going to talk about geometry and topology. So we change gears, we forget for now about, about, about this pendulum and gyroscope and emergence. And we'll talk just about geometry and topology and how to understand these concepts. And then we try to put these things together. Okay, what is geometry? Uh, geometry from ancient Greek is, is uh, measuring, this is a branch of mathematics concerned with questions of shape, size, relative positions of figures, and properties of space. This is what you learn in school. You do triangles and various types of theorems. So the more the earlier geometry was actually concerned with properties of those lines, points, and figures in space. The modern geometry is more like studying spaces themselves. is the one space which we are given here, or general, some quite abstract spaces. The space usually is endowed by geometric properties, such as distance, proximity, and then we study space, properties of the space with those properties. That's what contemporary geometry often does. And our focus in this talk will be not even geometry itself, but the emergence of geometry. But before that, we will think about a few geometrical concepts which, which are characterizing this, the various spaces, and then we will see how they emerge in physics. So let us start with the example of parallel transport, connection, and curvature. These are examples of these geometric properties that I'm talking about. And uh, let us start with the idea of intrinsic geometry. Suppose this end, lives on the surface of a sphere, like somewhat similarly to us living on the surface of the Earth, which is, which is also curved. But let's assume that this end is actually two-dimensional, or very small in height, so this end cannot use third dimension. Suppose that you are on Earth, so how would you know that the Earth is round? How did people learn that the Earth is round? Uh, 
Actually, the first, uh, the first uh, ideas came because people watched the ships going into the sea, and they saw that ships go beneath the horizon. But that's cheating, because it's three-dimensional point of view, right? They used height. Suppose that it's actually really two-dimensional. Can we do that? Can we find out that this object is round, that it's curved? Okay? And it turns out that, yes, you can. And uh, so this is a question, and you can. And for this, the concept of parallel transport is very useful. Okay? So it is very easy to transport vector along the straight line. You just take vector at point A, and then just preserving this angle, move it to point B. And we are saying that this vector is obtained by parallel transport of the vector from point A to point B along the straight line. Okay? It's very easy to do this. So how would I transport vector from point, to A, from point A to point B on a surface of a sphere? Okay, it's also relatively simple. So what we're going to do is we're considering the large circle connecting point A and B. This, the, I, it's enough only for me to, to look at this arc. And then I just transport this vector in such a way that I preserve the angle between this vector and this arc of the large circle. And large circle is the one which center is, coincides with the center of the sphere, uh, parallel to itself. And I call it parallel to itself, and this is the result. Okay? You might ask, how do I know that this arc is the arc of the large circle? Because I do not have access to the whole sphere, but only to part of it. But I will say that this large circle is known to be the shortest distance between two points. So what I can do is I can just take point A and B, find the shortest distance, and then transport vector in such a way that the angle between this shortest distance curve and the vector is constant. Okay? And this uh, shortest distance, shortest curve between two given points is known as the geodesic line. So basically, I'm, it's easy to transport the vector along the geodesic line. You just preserve the angle. Okay? So that's parallel transport along the geodesic line. And this is some demo which is easy to do for any one of you. It's absolutely not dangerous. Uh, let's try to transport the vector from point one, this vector from point one on a sphere, basically from North Pole, to point two, then point two three, and then to point one. So this is the arc of the large circle. So I transport this vector, the angle was zero, and it is zero still. Then the angle, then I transport along this arc of the large circle. The angle was 90 degrees, and it's still 90 degrees here. And then I transport this vector back to point one along this arc of the large circle, and the, vector, the angle is zero, so it's zero here, and I get this vector. But this vector is not the same vector as the original one. So if on a curved surface I parallel transport vector on, a clo on the closed path, the vector actually rotates. Okay? This is what we see. Uh, why I said that this experiment is very easy to do? This is how you do it at home or anywhere. So basically, you think about my shoulder as the center of the sphere. So then, basically, this is radius vector, and, and this, basically, if I move it, the, the, the my points of my figure move on the, on the surface of the sphere. Okay? So now, if this is, for example, the large circle, right? Because this is center, and I'm doing circle with radius here. This is not large circle, because the center of this circle is here, not here. Okay? Now, this is a vector, and I parallel transport it. This way, this way, this way. So you can see I started from here, got here. Right? So you can do morning exercise and kind of do parallel transport simultaneously. Okay? So let's do a little bit more quantitatively. So first of all, we notice that when you go counterclockwise, the vector also rotated counterclockwise. We say in this case that the curvature is positive. Try at home to think about some surface with negative curvature. That's a good exercise if you don't know the answer. And the angle of rotation in this particular case is pi over 2, 90 degrees, right? And the area surrounded by this path, everybody, I hope, knows the area of the sphere, right? So, can you say it? Well, I hope I heard 4 pi r squared. I'm not sure. So, the angle of this particular sector is 1 eighth of a sphere. Right? So the area is 4 pi r squared divided by 8, which is pi r squared divided by 2. And now if you just divide this angle of rotation by the area, you get 1 over r squared. This is definition of the curvature. Strictly speaking, the curvature can be different at different times, and then you really have to take small uh, paths to do that definition. But in, in sphere, curvature is constant, therefore it's this, this, this thing works. Yes. 
Okay, better? Okay, good. Okay, so in this particular case, the curvature, or Gaussian curvature, is equal to 1 over r squared. And let's do some exercise which will be useful later. Let's try the total area of the sphere and multiply by Gaussian curvature. Okay? So the Gaussian curvature is 1 over r squared. S, total area of the sphere, is 4 pi r squared. So I get 4 pi, which I will choose to write as 2 pi times 2. Okay? So let's just remember this exercise. We will use it in a couple of slides. And uh, the next step will be to learn how to parallel transport vector along the arbitrary curved surface with not necessarily constant curvature and along the arbitrary line. Okay? The way you do it is the following, that you just basically transport this vector from point A to this point first. You assume that this is small piece is a piece of the geodesic, the shortest distance curve, and then you preserve the angle between this geodesic and, and this vector. You transport it this way, then you can see the two next points, connect them by geodesic and transport it in such a way as preserve the angle, and so on and so forth, and you end up with some vector at point B. The problem, so we have connection. This is called connection. We have a way of taking vector at point A and, okay, Okay, we have, a, we have a way of taking vector at point A and transport it along the any given path to other point B. The problem is that at this point, I still cannot compare vector at point A and point, a, at point B because they're different points. I cannot really bring them together. So it's, it's in, in one place, it's another place, how to compare them. And uh, what we are going to do is we are going, using connection, using the way of transporting in parallel way, we can transport it in a closed path. And then the two vectors will be at the same point, and I can compare them and see what the rotation angle is. Okay? So using connection, I can see the rotation of the vector, and this way, if I can see the small path, I can define curvature of the surface. Notice that I never used the idea of three-dimensional space, that I look at the surface from outside. This end can do on, on the surface directly. Okay? That's, that's called intrinsic geometry, the geometry from within the surface. Okay. Now let's do the following exercise. We compute the Gaussian curvature along this very small closed pass. We multiply it by the area of this pass, and we sum up over all those cells which cover the whole surface. Okay. This is called integral of curvature over, over the area. How many of you know integrals, or at least some idea of integrals? Most of you. So it's good. So in any case, even if you don't know, this is what I just said. You just take small pieces, you take curvature multiplied by the area, and you add all these pieces together. This is called integral of curvature over the surface. And the remarkable result, try to prove it yourself, uh, I will just claim the result, that for this particular surface, it will be 2 pi times 2, which is exactly the same for the sphere. Okay? But remember, in sphere, it was constant curvature and known area. Here, I do not know actually the area, I do not know curvature of this place, but I'm sure that if you integrate curvature over the area, you'll get 2 pi times 2. Okay? So, this is an interesting result which belongs to the realm of topology. It turns out that no matter how I deform this surface, the result will, be sti will still be 2 pi times 2, with some exceptions which we now explain. So, topology. So, in mathematics, topology uh, is concerned with the properties of space that are preserved under continuous deformations, such as stretching, crumpling, and bending, but not tearing and gluing. That's the only the remark that you should do. So you should not tear surface and glue two surfaces together, two pieces of the surface together, but you can deform it and stretch it in any way. You can think of topology as geometry in some kind of rubber space, where you can really change arbitrarily distances between points, but you still have concept of, of neighbored points. You really have two points kind of next to each other, they kind of remain next to each other even when you deform surface. Okay? So, the curvature of the surface is the geometric properties. Is it topological property? The curvature at the surface at a given point. So, think about it this way. Suppose that I take surface, calculate the curvature at a particular point, and then I deform the surface. Will the curvature change? It will. So, therefore, it is not topological property, it's geometric property. But the integral of the curvature over the whole surface is a topological property known as Euler characteristics. Okay? 
So Leonard Euler was the mathematician who first considered this type of constructions. And uh, what we illustrated here is that we can, and what we can specify some connection on a surface, some way to parallel transport vectors. And using connection, we can define curvature. And if you take global characteristics, integrate this curvature over the whole surface, you get Euler characteristics, which is already a topological property. Okay? So this is what I want you to get from this geometry topology. This is more or less this uh, uh, small lesson. So can I change the earlier characteristic of the surface in some way? Yes, I can. If I do uh, operations which are not allowed in topology, like, like uh, punching holes, gluing, and, and, and tearing, right? And in particular, the gauss bonnet theorem tells you that the integral of the curvature of a surface is always 2 pi times some integer number. And for simple surfaces, this integer number is just equals 2 minus 2 times number of handles. Okay? So a sphere does not have any handles. G equals 0. The earlier characteristics is 2. That's why we get 2 pi times 2. And although it's the sphere which is drawn here, but you can draw any surface of topology of sphere, any surface which can be deformed into sphere without tearing or gluing. Okay? Similarly, if you have this donut shape, it's torus, then it's one handle, g equals one, so you will get always zero. And by the way, you can ask, how can I integrate some curvature over the surface and get zero? Does it mean that it's always zero? Not necessarily, it means that it's positive and negative. In particular, for this donut which is drawn here, you can easily check yourself that, for example, at this point, the curvature is positive, and at the point inside, it's actually negative. It's like a saddle point. It goes this way and goes this way. According to definitions that I gave you, if you do this uh, and uh, calculate the curvature, it will be negative at those points. And so on and so forth. You take some surface with G handles, you get 2 minus 2G, and you know that the answer of, for this integral will be this. That's very important theorem in topology. And this is just an example of interplay between topology and geometry. So curvature is geometric property, but this integral turns out to be a topological property and does not really depend on the precise surface up to, up to deformations. Okay? Any questions? So let us move on to, to the central subject, which is falling cats. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to explain you uh, how cats are able to rotate themselves in the air and, and land on their feet, as I promised. Uh, first of all, definition. It's actually known as cat writing reflex is a cat's natural ability to turn itself around as it falls, so it will land on its feet. It turns out that this writing reflex starts to happen at three, four weeks of age. So a kitten of three, four weeks of age already starts doing this right, and by six weeks they usually do it perfectly. So it's kind of amazing. Okay, so basically you know the explanation already, uh, but we would, we're going to talk a little bit in more detail. So how is it possible? Well, there were different versions of, of the explanations. Not in this, this movie is correct. But before that, for example, people would say that cat manages to push off the support before the jump. But this can be easily checked. If you just take a control experiment, and there are nice videos about that, then, then you can really start cat without any intrinsic uh, initial rotation. And the cat still lands on, on its feet. Then the next one is cat pushes off the air. In principle, possible. But the effect is too tiny, it will not be enough to explain how fast they, they do that. And the cat rotates its tail, making itself rotate in the opposite direction. This is actually very common. The people very often think that the cat does it with its tail. Okay? We will talk about tail a bit more, but the problem is that there are many cats without tails, and they still do it. So, so it kind of cannot be a universal explanation. And something else, and we will going to talk about something else. So first we will try to... Uh, to see why is it surprising in the first place that cats can do that. And our surprise usually comes because of comparison with translational motion. So let's start with translational motion. The first, I'll, I'll go quickly because you know all mechanics already. So, so let's consider collision of two different balls of, say, mass m and mass 2m. So the balls, this is time. So the ball, balls coming to each other with velocity v and velocity v over 2. And then they collide and then they uh, bounce back. Okay, what you notice is that there is some point which is constant in time, it's not moving at all. So this is my coordinate, this is my time. So you can see that this point, which is shown here by this line, is not moving at all. And this point is always 
two to one ratio of the segment connecting the centers of those balls. So this is basically the center of mass of these two balls. So if these two balls move with this velocity, this point is not moving in space. Okay? So there is some point which is not moving although balls collide. So similarly, if you have arbitrary system of point-like masses, or not necessarily point-like masses, there is always a point which is called center of mass, which acts in a relatively simple way if there are no external forces. This is important. So there can be collisions between those balls, and there can be in forces of interactions between those balls, but we insist that there are no external forces. For example, there is no gravity, otherwise the whole thing falls down. Okay? So for this system, without external forces, if the center of mass is initially at rest, it will remain at rest in the absence of external forces. Okay? So there is some point which is not moving. So, why is that? Because of Newton's laws. And Newton's third law says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if two bodies interact, that the force with which body one acts on body two is the same but opposite to the force with which body two acts on body one. So if you consider this as a system, the sum of these forces is zero. So internal forces inside the system cancel each other. Okay? The sum of all internal forces in the system is equal to zero. Now, Newton's second law tells us that the change of the momentum of the system is equal to the net force multiplied by time. Okay? Or the rate of the change of momentum equals to the force. So, uh, if the net force, that net external force, is zero, then the total momentum of the system is not changing. So, let's do a couple of formulas. If net external force, this is external force, is zero, then the total momentum of the system is constant all the time. But this total momentum of the system, if it's zero initially, it means that this is zero, and it means that the rate of change of this quantity is constant. Okay? And this is quantity is the basically position of the center of mass. So it means that the position of the center of mass is constant if, there is, if momentum of the system is zero and there are no external forces. So center of mass is always at rest, if it's initially at rest. Okay? So, we conclude that internal forces cannot move the center of mass. But now let's assume that you have a spaceship, and you want to move this spaceship in space. And you try to rearrange things inside the spaceship. And then if you return these things back, then the will, ship will move back to its initial position, because center of mass should be at the same place. Right? This is what should be different in rotation, so, and, and, and we will see how. So internal forces essentially cannot move the system in space. And therefore, we are very surprised that CAT, which is not rotating initially, somehow manages to change orientation. Okay? How can the CAT get angular momentum? Because there is a conservation of angular momentum. So let's go over that. First of all, there is a simple dictionary between rotational and translational motion. In translation, use coordinates. In rotation, use angle, velocity, angular velocity, and so on and so forth. The most important things for us will be, instead of mass, will be distribution of mass which is characterized by moment of inertia. By the way, let me get some feeling. Moment of inertia, who, who knows this concept? Okay. Almost all, but not all. So I will say a few words about that. And instead of momentum, you use angular momentum, the, the similar quantity associated with rotation. And again, the, actually, instead of momentum conservation, we will get angular momentum conservation. And if we go really deep, then the consequence, the momentum conservation is a consequence of the symmetry of the space, which is uniformity of the space. The fact that the laws of physics are the same in all positions in space. And angular momentum conservation is actually the consequence of another symmetry of space, which is called isotropy of space. The fact that space is the same in all uh, directions. Okay? But this will not concern us in this talk. So angular momentum. So, angular momentum is r cross p, the product of the vector times momentum vector, the, the radius vector times momentum vector. Uh, numerically, it's equal to the mv, the p, multiplied by this moment arm, by t. And direction is, using right-hand rule, in this particular case, the direction is out of the screen. Okay? So, so these are all necessary formulae. You can see that this momentum of the, the value of the angular momentum for this particular case, is d times mv, and if you instead remember that v is omega times d, you'll get m d squared times omega. So it's proportional to omega, to the angular frequency of rotation, multiplied by m times d squared. Important thing is that it's not just mass, but it's important how far this mass 
from 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 the the reference point and uh, uh, and, and also using the direction of the momentum. Okay, so. For solid body, you have to divide this solid body into many pieces and add those angular momentum of all these pieces together to get the total angular momentum of solid body. Okay? But the good thing is that if solid body rotates around some axis, then omega, the angular velocity, is the same for all points. So you basically can take this formula and sum it up, and you get something like this. That the angular momentum of the rotation along this axis of rotation is equal to some quantity which is called moment of inertia and which characterizes the distribution of mass with respect to distance to this axis multiplied by the angular velocity of rotation okay so if you have a solid body like this gyro the faster it rotates the bigger the angular momentum and the farther the mass from the center the bigger the angular momentum okay any questions am i going too fast Okay, so the angular momentum can be changed only by the torque. This is the analog of Newton's law for rotational motion. The sum of the torques of all internal forces is again zero, because those forces are opposite and along the same line. Okay? And in the absence of external torques, the net angular momentum should be conserved, because the rate of the change of angular momentum is equal to the net torque, and it is zero if there is no, no external forces. So, this is very important law, and it's used in many situations in, 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 to, under, to, to understand many phenomena, you have to understand this law. For example, the stability of the top, rotating top, or gyroscope, as you see, even stability of the bike is partially related to, to this uh, rotation. The figure skaters and gymnasts use this a lot. When they try to rotate faster, they just tuck their hands in, and then they, they decrease the moment of inertia, and therefore, omega should increase because angular momentum is conserved. And Kepler's second law actually is a direct consequence of, of, the, second, uh, of, of the conservation of angular momentum, but okay, we will not concern ourselves with stars and, and, and planets this time. Okay? So, now let me come up with first theorem of this talk. I call it rigid cat's theorem. So, in the absence of external torques, the net angular momentum of the system is conserved. Our system is cat. Okay? If initially angular momentum is zero, then it's always zero. Second statement. For solid rigid bodies, the angular momentum is essentially proportional to angular frequency. And if L is zero, then it means that omega is zero at all times. But angular velocity is the rate of the change of the angle, and it's zero, it means that angles do not change, and the, none of the angles do change, so cat cannot uh, change orientation in space. Okay? The first theorem is that an absolutely rigid cat released upside down without initial push will never be able to land on its feet. Okay? So how do cats land on their feet then? So the main idea is that cats are not rigid, and that's why we like them, right? Okay. So remember our ideas, the cat manages to push off support, cat pushes off the air, then the most promising was the cat rotates its tail. So let's consider this one. And indeed, you can consider cat. Yeah, that's my cat. You can consider cat, and you can assume that cat is trying to rotate the tail and say in this direction. Then, by conservation of angular momentum, the rest of the body of the cat should rotate in opposite direction. More precisely, this relation should hold. The total angular momentum is zero. It means that, that basically you can find the rotation uh, speed of the, of the body of the cat. And therefore, cat can actually change orientation using just rotating tail. It can, it can do that. It turns out that there are two problems with that. First of all, this is not so big effect, and secondly, there are cats without tails who, who, who do that uh, equally good. So this, can, this is possible explanation, but not a good one for, for real cats. This is a better explanation. This is actually from Wikipedia, very nice illustration. Uh, so this is animation, I will show this animation, no sound, so I will try to explain what's going on here. So basically, this is the, the direct consequence of not rigidity of cat. Cat can actually bend and can rotate front part and, and, and rear part slightly differently. So let's see how it, how, how it does it. So this is what, what's shown here. 
So let's consider these two pictures separately. So let's look at this picture. The front of the cat rotates in this direction, which means that angular momentum uh, is directed this way, according to right-hand rule, right? You just take this front part and, and you do this, so this is the direction of angular momentum of the front part of the cat, okay? The, for the rear part, the same way you obtain the angular momentum, which shows this way. Okay, the sum of this is not zero. Let's forget about this cat, and let's consider this cat. Suppose that cat just bent and just rotates as a whole, okay, in this direction. Then, according to the right-hand rule, its angular momentum is that way, okay? And now put these two pictures together, impose one of the another. So suppose that cat does both this and this. Then the sum of all angular momentum is zero at all times. But you can see that cat definitely changes the orientation in space. Yeah, let's, let's take a look, yeah. Can you see that? So good orientation, upside down, and so on and so forth. So this is more or less what happens. So by rotating independently front and back, the cat can maintain total angular momentum to be zero at all times, but, but being able to change the overall orientation after going back to initial shape, okay? This is on Wikipedia, so you can watch it after as, as much as you, can, as you want. So, so basically, we have the following algorithm. So cat, cats bend in the middle so that the front half of their body turns in the opposite direction than the rear half. Okay, look at this picture. So you see, they bend in the middle and can rotate the part here independently of the right. Tuck their front legs to reduce the moment of inertia. So cat actually doesn't just do the previous picture, but it optimizes the, the, in the following way. That uh, the cat tucks in the, the front uh, path, so the moment of inertia of the front is small. The moment of inertia of the, of the back part is big, because it's actually stretching legs, real legs. So therefore, rotating the, first, the front part in, in the, say, clockwise direction, the, the back part rotates in counterclockwise direction, but in, at, by much smaller angle. So the difference can be uh, between 90 degrees and 10 degrees. Okay? Then Katz does it opposite. She, it, it tucks the rear legs to, to, towards the body and spreads the front legs, and then uh, basically rotates back. But now, because the moment of inertia of the front is big, the front is almost not moving, staying in the same position, and back just comes to, 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 to align with the front. Okay? And then basically, Cats can even do repeat if necessary. Some cats cannot do it in, in one motion, then they just repeat it several times and the, until they orient it in the right direction, and then they land. And they usually stretch their legs, in, as you saw in the movie, so that to soften the, the impact. Okay? So this is basically what cats do. Okay? And the question is, okay, first of all, let me show this, the most important move here. Just repeat it one particular move. You see, tucking front legs and spreading the rear legs allows cat to rotate front uh, by bigger angle and the rear by small angle. Okay? And the question is, what does it have to do with geometry in the way we described previously? Okay? And let me try to connect it to the previous definition. So basically, uh, one first problem which appears is let's try to describe it, it describes the orientation of the cat. So suppose this, this is the first shape A of the cat, and this is shape B. And I ask you, what is the angle of rotation of cat here relative to this form? And you cannot tell me, right? Because how can you compare, and how, this is just not the same shape, you cannot really compare them. Okay? So the way to do it is, to actually attach to cat, for every shape of the cat, three orthogonal vectors. Uh, red, green, and blue. Okay? So let's assume huge space of all shapes of cat. So take a particular cat and all shapes, for all shapes you attach three axes in some particular way, it doesn't matter which one. Okay? So you have infinitely dimensional space of shapes of cat. It's getting off. Okay, so, and, and you attach these three axes. Then you can compare, right? Then you can easily say that, that whatever, I, I can just rotate these three axes by some angles to make them the same as, as these three axes, and this will be three angles determining the position of the cat in the shape B compared to the shape A. Okay? It's very easy. 
So now we can define relative orientation of two shapes by just arranging the axes with respect to each other. And if I know how shape changes the particular path in a space of shapes, I know the sequence of shapes going from A to B, then I can use physics. Now this is physics. So we take Newton's law, conservation of angular momentum, and we compute. This is hard computation. We compute and we find how, what the new position of the cat is. But because we already attached the three vectors, we can actually uh, represent this position in terms of just three earlier angles, which, which are necessary to orient solid state in, in space. Okay? So basically, having sequence of shapes from A to B, I can compute the rotation in terms of just three angles. Okay? And this should remind you something. This is what we did with connection. So it's like we're trying to take these three angles and parallel transport them in a space of shapes. So every path in a space of shapes determines the, the change of those angles. Okay? So we have connection in the space of all shapes of cats. Okay? This is much more difficult space than what we used so far. Right? Just by the, the surface of the sphere is nothing, just two-dimensional, and this is infinitely dimensional. Try to imagine all possible shapes of the cat. But nevertheless, we use the same type of, of method for infinitely dimensional space. So the result, of course, strongly depends on our arbitrary choice of axis. Right? Remember that I started by just attaching three arbitrary axes to all shapes of cats in some totally arbitrary way. So result obviously depends on that. Oops, okay, I have to go through. And for the closed path, however, the change of orientation is very well defined. If you take the cat in this shape, go in some sequence of shapes to point B, and then go into some sequence of shapes again to point A, then there are no arbitrariness here, because I compare the same shape with the same shape. And I can just look at those vectors and see what the angle is. So if cat returns to its initial shape, I know the change of the position of the shape, uh, or, or position of the cat in space, if, of course, I were able to solve this Newton's law. But suppose we, we can. Okay? So for closed paths, the change of orientation is well defined, and we can even define the curvature of this connection. Try to see how, how fast it changes when you change shape. Okay? So this is the mathematics what we talked about. So can I touch something? Okay, good. So this is mathematics we talked about. In this particular case, it's realized as the mathematics of a connection in a space of shapes. Here, it's two-dimensional section of the space of shapes. Again, the space is infinitely dimensional. Suppose there are two parameters, some of the parameters of the shape. And if I make a closed path along some direction, then the, that path specifies the three angles of rotation of the cat if cat deforms shape in this particular way. And this serves as a parallel transport in, 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 this, in this very sp special space. Okay, any questions here? Yes? It will. Oh, it will. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The, it will depend. Any closed path will give you different in, in general results. So what you can do in, instead, you can just take this particular closed path, make it smaller and smaller and smaller, and introduce the rate, which will be curvature for this particular two-dimensional cross-section. But, but, but it, it will depend on the closed path. It's more than things that we can actually compute it for any path, and this is well-defined quantity. Okay. So, for example, if you have a design like, suppose that you have a spaceship and you want to change orientation of this spaceship in space. You can do two things. You can first using, use some small, small engines, and, and, or small, they usually just blow air from some particular places, and then they just, by, by jet effects, they, they change the orientation. But this is uh, subtle, because if you, if, you, if you give angular momentum to the spaceship, then you have to then slow it down because it will continue rotating. What you can do instead is you can reorient things inside the spaceship, and according to all this, you actually can change the, the position of the spaceship. And there are different questions of control, of how, what's the best way to, to do that, to change the orientation of things in space. But that depends on the, your definition of efficiency, and this is in, in robots, this is quite quite known problem. Of they, they often do this robotic arms, they change orientation of robotic arms using some, some particular devices uh, changing the shape. And, and the question is how to do it in the most effective way, 
and what is the most effective way, and so on and so forth. There is some piece of both mathematics and applied mathematics and engineering. Okay, so this is what brings us our previous mathematical definition to the to the CAT physics. And now I have just several few minutes. I'm not sure how exactly many uh, to talk about quantum Hall effect. And the quantum Hall effect is my favorite subject in physics, and uh, it's basically already been subject of two Nobel Prizes. Uh, the first one is the discovery of integer quantum Hall effect by Klaus von Klitzing in 1980. was given Nobel Prize in 85. You can see how small the time difference between discovery and Nobel Prize. This is very rare. This is because this effect was very clear and very fundamental, and it was clear right away. And the other Nobel Prize was given by uh, Laughlin, Stormer, and Tsui. Laughlin was theorist, and Stormer and Tsui discovered uh, experimentally fractional quantum Hall effect. And so this is an amazing subject. This, I think this is the, one of the most important discoveries of 20th century. And we are not going to talk about various aspects of quantum Hall effect, only about some very small particular things. So let me first uh, explain for those who do not know what quantum Hall effect is about. So first of all, there is a classical Hall effect. As I was told, many of you already studied electricity and magnetism. And you know that if you have magnetic field and you have particle, charged particles which move in the magnetic field, magnetic field acts on the particle according to right-hand rule in, with a force perpendicular to the velocity of the particle. Okay? So what Edwin Hall, who was a student at that time, or the PhD student, uh, uh, did in 1979, he took a sample and he put it in magnetic field, perpendicular to the sample, and then he sent a current through the sample, and he found out that there is a voltage not only along the current, as we used to from Ohm's law, but also in the perpendicular direction due to the fact that magnetic field is trying to deviate electrons in this direction. Okay? So he plotted essentially something like this. The, the purple plot is the ohm's resistance, basically this voltage divided by this current, this voltage divided by this current, uh, as a function of magnetic field, and it's almost the same. It doesn't change too much. But then, of course, if you divide transversal voltage, whole voltage, it's called now, by the current, that you get also something of dimensions of units of resistivity, but it will be proportional to magnetic field, because force for a magnetic field is proportional to magnetic field. So this is what classical whole effect is. Okay? The fact that there is such, such whole resistance. And inverse property, inverted property is called whole conductance. Okay? So the question which I'm asking here is what will happen to this whole effect in extreme conditions? And extreme conditions are First of all, let's put all electrons to the very surface of semiconductor. So it's basically a two-dimensional sample. Let's make it very, very clean. So there are some impurities, but almost none. Okay. Let's make very low temperatures of the order of Kelvin or lower. And let's put it in very strong magnetic field, the strongest magnets we used at, at that time. Okay. And the question is, what will happen with that picture? And rem remind you, the picture is this one. Okay? So th this is what happens. So these are two plots. So instead of this red curve, we have this curve with many plateaus. And instead of this horizontal uh, curve, we have something like this, really wild. Okay? But the most amazing feature was that there was this big, huge plateau at a very particular magnetic field, which in this case, 10 Tesla really big magnetic field. So there was a huge plateau at precisely the value which is h divided by e squared, where h is a Planck constant, which is constant responsible for quantum mechanics, and e is a charge of electron. So can you imagine how striking this is? So this is some system of semiconductors, which is characterized by what atoms there are, like, like what's the impurities, what's the distance between atoms, what's the property of the surface, a lot of stuff. And the result of this measurement is to the most fundamental constant in nature. One is H, Planck constant of quantum mechanics, and another is electron charge. Okay? And the accuracy with which this is exactly one in this unit is one in a billion. So now, actually, this, this quantum Hall effect serves as a, as, a, as a standard of resistivity. 
So now instead of having some resistor in some safe somewhere, which is the etalon of resistivity, we say that if you want good resistance uh, as an etalon, build quantum hole uh, apparatus and measure. Okay? And this is what really is now. Okay, so this is a picture. Uh, so simple analysis shows that if you take H divided by E squared, you will get something of the, of, the, of the units of resistivity, and it's actually 25 kilo ohm, but not just 25 kilo ohm, but with, known with this accuracy. This is standard of resistivity now. Okay? <laughs> and there are many plateaus there. There is a plateau at one, there is a plateau at one half, and, and here it's inverted, which is plotted. One half is two, three, four. So these are called integer quantum hole plateaus. And then later, in 1983, three years later, there were additional plateaus discovered at fractions of the, of the, of the, of the conductivity. And that's a separate story, fractional quantum hole effect. So I just say that the ingredients which are necessary to explain all of this is well, understanding of force acting from magnetic field on electrons, laws of quantum mechanics, the role of disorder is actually crucial, important for explanation. And basically, so if you put all this together, take into account some complicated physics of localization of electrons in magnetic fields, then you will be able to explain integer quantum Hall effect. If you want to explain additional fractional quantum Hall effect, you also have to add interactions between electrons, which play a crucial role. And the exactness of the quantization of the exactness of this plateau is, as I said, one in a billion. And this, however, can be explained by gauge and topological arguments. And topology is what we were talking about, so I will try to do my best to show what kind of arguments these are. So let me skip the digression about how wonderful fractional quantum hole effect fluid is. And this is the most remarkable property is whole conductivity itself, which, show, which tells you that the density of the current is proportional to electric field in perpendicular direction. So current in direction X is proportional to electric field in direction Y. But there are also other similar quantities which were also attracted a lot of attention recently, whole viscosity and thermal whole conductivity, which are of similar type, maybe less universal. So. so let us go to this main argument in the field, which is called Laughlin's argument. So for this, we will do something unthinkable from experimental point of view, although experimentalists are doing better and better, so maybe they will be able to do that. So let's consider, as I said, the quantum hole effect requires two-dimensional surface. Let's take this two-dimensional surface and make a donut out of it, torus, okay? So this torus is the surface on which I will put my electrons to move. Experimentally, this is very hard because this surface is the surface of the bulk semiconductor, so it's really hard to do that. But let's assume that as theorists, we can do that. So this is torus, and on, on the surface of the torus, electrons move. So, for example, the magnetic field I was talking about is perpendicular to the surface at every point. At this point, it's this way, 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 and so on and so forth. All is perpendicular to the surface. Electrons move there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do something else. I'm going to take a thin solenoid with magnetic field inside. Oops, too fast. And I will put magnetic field through this solenoid in one of the holes of the torus. Okay? And then I will take solenoid with magnetic field inside and put it through the other hole of the torus, under the surface. Okay? Now, notice that in, from the point of view of classical mechanics, I did something ridiculous, because magnetic field inside of this solenoid, electrons never feel it. Okay? So, from the point of view of classical physics, nothing's going on here. These fluxes are not important. However, in quantum mechanics, when electron goes around the flux, even if there is no magnetic field here, the electron picks up the phase. Electrons are characterized by wave functions, by some complex numbers, and then pick up the phase which is proportional to this flux. Okay? So actually something happens, they're sensitive to those fluxes. And what we are going to do is we are going to consider the space of fluxes. Okay? Instead of space of shapes, i tell you right in advance, I can see that the flux in x direction, flux in y direction. It turns out, for some reasons of gauge invariance and for the reasons that the phase is a number from 0 to 2 pi and then it rotates back, we know that the, if I put flux equals 1 in the appropriate unit, then indeed it will be not observable. So the whole system is periodic in flux, only flux is between 0 and 1 matter. So I have this is my space of shapes, this is my space of parameters characterizing this particular system. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
take these fluxes and change them along this path very slowly. This very slowly is very important. This is very subtle things that I will probably skip it, but this is why it's called adiabatic transport, that we have to do it very slowly. Because in principle, result could depend on the speed with which I'm doing that. But if speed is very slow, it's very small, then the result will depend only on the shape of this path. And this is where we can introduce our concepts. So the wave function of the whole many-body system of all billions and billions and billions of electrons will change along this closed path uh, and in the space of fluxes. So we have connection. Right? For every path, you can ask how much the change of the wave function changed, uh, how much the, the phase of the wave function changed along this closed path. And the curvature of this connection has the meaning of whole conductance, of that particular ratio of current to the voltage in the perpendicular direction. That's amazing. I will not explain it, but that's relatively easy to show. But the more subtle thing is that if I take the curvature and integrate it over the whole space which is allowed from 0 to 1, then what I obtain is the, is the Gauss-Bonnet invariant, the topological invariant, which is essentially physically means that it's called conductance averaged over fluxes. So what we obtain is that this whole conductance averaged over fluxes is actually topological invariant, which means that it's very robust. If I add impurities, a few of them, it will not change it because it's a topological invariant. As, as you remember, if I deform the sphere, this uh, 2 pi times 2 does not change unless deformations are strong and, and involve tearing and gluing. So this integrated whole conductance mathematically is known as churn class and physically it's just averaged whole conductance over fluxes. And in the particular, for the particular reasons, because everything is periodic in values of these fluxes, this churn class in this case is actually integer number. And this explains why whole conductance in the previous plots was integer number. And the fact that it's topological explains why the accuracy is so huge, that it's one in a billion or better. Okay? So, what I see is that the concept of adiabatic transport, that physical system depends on parameters. Physics defines connection in the space of parameters for slow change of parameters. Connection defines transport and curvature. Transport and curvature often have physical meaning and corresponds to a physical quantity. And under appropriate conditions, additional conditions, the integrated curvature is topological invariant, and physical quantities are quantized and take discrete, for example, integer values. So, just to put things together, for falling cats, our parameters were shapes of cat. For quantum hole, it were fluxes. For physics, in falling cats was relatively simple, although also not quite easy to solve for arbitrary shape of the cat, was rotational dynamics. And in quantum holes, this is complicated problem of quantum electrons in magnetic field with impurities and so on and so forth. The transport was corresponding to rotation in the physical space of the cat. And in quantum hole effect, it was a transport of electric charge. And the particular quantization uh, uh, conditions were not uh, there for falling cats. But for quantum hole effect, the space of fluxes can be considered as donut itself, because everything is periodic, you can glue this part to this part and this part to this part, and you will get donut again. And donut is compact, it's small and doesn't, it's not infinite space. And therefore, in this particular case, there was a quantization of whole conductance, which would take on the integer numbers. So this is basically these things together. So now some conclusions. Uh, I hope that you're not that tired, and this is just half a minute. So, similar laws can underlie the physics of cat landing and the physics of quantum electrons. The only uh, way to, to understand that is to find the right language for that. The geometry and topologies themselves can emerge as a conspiracy of a huge number of microscopic degrees of freedom. Remember that this geometry in the space of fluxes is due to the actual motion of many, many quantum electrons, you know, sometimes strongly interacting and also with impurities and so on and so forth. One can imagine, for example, that our space and time themselves uh, may also be immersion. And this is actually a series which I seriously consider, that what we see is the concept of the distance in this space is actually emergence from some small fluctuations of something which we don't know quite well. Something like quantum gravity, for example. And remembering the quote of the Feynman, the science takes a lot of imagination. 
And I would just add here that another challenge is to keep imagination consistent with known laws of physics and rules of math. And this is usually the hard part, to have both. And we saw in the history of physics a lot of amazing breakthroughs due to unlimited imagination and rigorous analysis of the creators. And uh, I'm confident that we will have a lot of surprises and great discoveries right around the corner. And I hope that for many of you it will be not conclusions but beginning of some adventure in the world of physics. And thank you very much. And I would also like to thank especially Rais, Sudesh and Anupam for help with demos, Gobi for the help with audio and video, and my daughter Rita for help with presentation. So if there are some grammatical mistakes, that's her fault. Okay. Thank you. So the floor is open for questions. Please raise your hand. How many of you have seen the cat falling and landing on fifth? Just, just curious. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, there's question. Uh, as you initially said that the for the realization of the quantum Hall effect, the sample should be very clean. But in the later slide, you have added one term that the disorder also should be there. Which so, term? Disorder. Disorder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's uh, dis disorder. Yeah. Uh, the this will take us a bit too far, but uh, it's, it turns out there, there are two main problems in integer quantum Hall effect. When you see this big, nice plateau, there are two things to explain. Why it's not just straight line, but actually plateau. And second is why this plateau is exactly at this value. What I was explaining, this argument, was why this is exactly at that value. Okay? But why this is plateau, not just one point. For this, you need disorder. And the way it works, basically, if you change magnetic field a little bit, it's essentially the same as adding electrons a little bit, but those electrons are captured by disorder. Okay? And therefore, there is a plateau. You can say, well, if less electrons, less conductivity, it will be not plateau, but it will be a little bit different. But then topological argument plays a role and explains you that although it's plateau, although electrons are, are kept, the other electrons move a little bit faster and exactly provide the same conductivity as before. So this is where disorder is important. It's a, disorder is also hiddenly important for, for this topological argument, which I, I oversimplified it, of course. But so this is one of the greatest arguments, and, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is about the quantum Hall effect. Uh, generally, semiconductors are supposed to work at, uh, better at higher temperatures. They have higher conductivities. So what was the need to use a semiconductor and that too at a low temperature for this uh, quantum Hall effect? So what actual experiment does is the initial experiment. Now they do it chemically, but the initial experiment was like this. You take a semiconductor, which is not conducting, essentially, and but you provide a little bit of, of, N, uh, of N impurities, so that which, which donor a little bit of electrons. And then you, you apply strong electric field, which brings those electrons to the surface. The reason it's done is that these electrons now live on the surface, but those impurities are far away, which provided electrons in the first place. Therefore, it's all very, very clean. So impurities are needed for Hall effect, but very few. If there are many of them, it, it's not working. So you have electrons which are basically very close to the surface. And due to quantum mechanics, you can say that not just they are close to the surface, but it's actually exactly two-dimensional. And the reason, the way it works is, is this way. That when you have electric field, you really have strong potential which attracts this electron to the surface. Okay? And because energy of electron is quantized, there is a ground state of electron in this direction. And if, because temperature is so low, the electron is always in the ground state in this transverse direction to the surface. 
Therefore, the only degrees of freedom which survive is the degrees of freedom of electron moving along the surface. So when you do this, you have two-dimensional electron gas moving on the surface, which you can think of being exactly two-dimensional. No direction in this motion, essentially, because it's averaged over. This is one of those averaging, which I was talking about, by the way. Uh, what was the need for the low temperature? I didn't quite understand. What was the need? Or... Yeah, it was... Yeah. If, if there is a high temperature, then there are several transverse motions. They are populated, the electrons move this way, this way, and so on and so forth. And it's not two-dimensional system. And this whole effect, two dimensions, are actually turns out to be very important. Uh, one more question about uh, parallel transport. So if I did understand it right, parallel transport uh, just uh, preserves the angle along a, a, the selected curve, right? Uh, along the geodesic curve. So, so yeah. and a geodesic is that curve which uh, makes the uh, distance between two points on a surface the shortest. Right. Um, in the uh, slide for, uh, on which you talked about uh, a general surface, yeah. parallel transport on a general surface, you mentioned the statement that uh, it can move on any curve and the angle is preserved at the point of the path, uh, at the geodesic at that point of the path. What does that mean? How can something be parallel? Okay, to so let's suppose that I ask you to transport vector not along the large circle, but along this circle. How would you do that? So you would start with this vector and you want to actually transport it like this. Okay, but center of the sphere is here. So I take this circle and make, for example, square out of it as approximation, okay? Then this piece of the square is more or less geodesic with center here. And this piece is another geodesic. So I preserve first angle here and then I angle with that side and so on and so forth, like I did for this big triangle. And so I guess I basically can transport it easily along the geodesic line, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Instead of this small circle, I want to consider the geodesic line, which is to every point of the circle, there will be geodesic line which is tangent to this one, the big circle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to preserve not the angle of this vector with this circle, but with geodesic which is tangent to the circle at this point. Okay? And this is how you do it. So, so from the point of view of end, this is very natural, because you really don't think about this closed curve. You just go and you see that this is the next point, and this is the shortest distance, and I just take vector transport there, then I think about next point, transport there, and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah. the curve is already defined, so why would we want to bother about keeping the angle parallel to the geodesic at that point? Because anyway, we are going to travel along that, this given curve. That's right, you, you can do that, but then you will, uh, you will have some quantity which is not that useful. So. Uh, if you have this curve, you, you can, in principle, to transport a uh, vector keeping this angle constant, right? Uh, but, but then what will it tell you except for what curve is? It will not tell you anything about the surface. It will tell you something about the curve. When I use the concept of geodesic of the shortest distance, that tells me about surface. And that's, that's why I want to do it this way. Thank you. So now we have a question from the web. Uh, Rajat Krishna asks, could you please comment on how quantum hole systems can be used for quantum computation? Quantum hole system for quantum computers. That takes us too far, probably, from the topic. Uh, so, and, um, and I actually exactly skipped the relevant slide for that. So let me try to get there. I just say a few words for one particular way people are trying to use it. So I have quantum hole here, and there was some slide which was digression uh, in the fractional quantum hole effect as an exotic fluid, okay? So in particular, there is a line here that quasi-particles in fractional quantum hole effect are massive. They have fractional charge and statistics. So if you go to the quantum hole state on that one third plateau, not the ones which I was talking about, about fractional quantum hole effect plateau, then the remarkable fact is that you can make a vortex in this fluid. You can think of these electrons as interacting electrons, and this is like a two-dimensional fluid. You can make a vortex in this fluid such that the charge of this vortex will be one third of the charge of electron. This is called fractionalization. So instead of charge, so you basically have a system which is made of charges one, and you make something which has charged one third. Can you imagine how you can take a lot of ones, sum them up, and get one third? That's what quantum holes 
fractional quantum whole system does. So you have charge one source. That's the first remarkable fact. Second, if you have two of those, and if you try to exchange them, then they behave, behave as particles which are not bosons, not fermions, but have some phase of the wave function changed by 2 pi over 3. So they have fractional statistics. Okay? So now the story about quantum computation was that if you're able to make sufficiently complicated quantum whole state with, with particles having things like these fractional statistics, you have to go one step more to have non abelian statistics. I'm not going to talk about it. And then by braiding those particles by, by exchanging them in some particular way, you can do your quantum computations. And because all these properties are topologically protected, then you really can do it with high accuracy and without, without losing. So this is general idea. How realistic this is, I'm not going to comment. It's so far people are trying to find those non abelian quantum whole state at least which have this fractional statistics. These are not just these simple states which I showed on this plot. These are more complicated states. This definitely stimulates experiment in quantum Hall effect, these ideas, so it's moving on. Whether, whether it will be achieved this particular way or some other architecture will be used for quantum computations, whether it's possible at all, I don't know. This may be one of those surprises which are around the corner. Yeah. Question? I have a very primary question, very simple question. You have tried showing us that quantum Hall effect and the cat falling have topological and geometrical similarities between each other. My question is, by looking at the cat falling and the geometrical similarities, have we been able to find a little more about quantum Hall effect by this comparison? I, I don't think so, uh, because um, so, so basically what I was trying to say is something different, that, that these concepts of modern geometry, these, these ideas of parallel transport, curvature, connection, they are very universal and then can be used uh, in, in many situations. And yes, I can imagine that looking at these two examples, for example, understanding why nothing is quantized in, 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 the, in the cat rotation and some whole conductance is quantized in quantum whole effect, looking at the differences, you can learn something. I don't think it happened in this particular case because actually it turns out that these relevant physics in uh, mathematics in quantum whole effect was developed earlier than for cats. The cat story is relatively recent, so it's, it's, uh, so it's quite interesting. So, but yes, uh, Applying the same type of mathematical language to many different phenomena usually helps you to understand more things. I'm not sure that this particular case is the best example in this, but yes. yes. There is a question over there. Uh, sir, I am happy to hear your uh, talk. And you mentioned that the center of mass is rotating the center of mass is also rotating. In my opinion, I feel that it may be stable. And uh, is any demo is possible to prove or show that the absolute center is moving or rotating? So, so let, me, let me be clear. Center of mass is not rotating. Center of mass is a point. And what I was saying is that, that in translational motion, if center of mass is at rest and no external forces, center of mass will be the same point. It will not move at all. And what I was saying is that for rotational motion, there is no analogous concept for center of mass. There is no angle which is not changing. Okay? Only if you have solid body, rigid body, then you can do something like that. But if, if shape is changing, there is just no analog of center of mass. Technically, it's just because those in uh, the P equals constant equation, we can integrate uh, easily in, in translational motion, but we cannot integrate corresponding equations for angular momentum. So, so I, I think it's some misunderstanding. No, I did not say that center of mass is rotating. Uh, so. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. What's the analog of uh, Euler characteristic for a falling cat? Yeah. Uh, it's. It's not necessarily Euler angle. This is Euler angle, particular angles which are, which are used to describe the position. Suppose that you have three vectors like this, and another, I should not, should have two left hands for that. So I have three vectors like that, and you want 
to describe this orientation with respect to this in some way. Okay? So how do you do that? Euler characteristic, like for a falling cat. Say what, is that, what is the analog of the, the geometry still has an Euler characteristic, right? So these are Euler vectors. So you basically rotate this way, that way, this way. You have, you have to rotate it three times. Oh, Euler characteristics. Okay. Okay. So the Euler himself noticed the following. I, I uh, recommend you to do this exercise if you did not do it so far. You take cube, the figure of cube, okay? And you count, let's do it one exercise together, and then I, 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 I give you all, all other bodies for your homework. So take cube. So how many faces do we have in a cube? Six. So how many edges do we have in a cube? Twelve. How many vertices we have in a cube? So now let's take the number of faces, subtract the number of edges, and add the number of vertices. So what do we get? Six minus eight plus twelve. No, uh, I meant for a falling cat, the different choice oh, of... Just, just, just a second, let me finish this one. So what you get is some number, so you can easily calculate. My claim is that if you have tetrahedron or some other polyhedron, then you will get the same number. And this is the same number that you will get by integrating curvature over the surface. That's Euler characteristics. So now we're talking about cat. Cat, like, um, out of all the possible maneuvers it would choose from, what, yeah. what, what, what is the right, I mean, what's the characteristic, I mean, given a cat video, could you come up, would you, could you tell me what is the Euler characteristic? Uh, yes. Or the churn class so, of the So, motion? I understand. So let's take space of shapes, okay? And uh, then in this space of shape, we have connection, as I described. So for every closed small loop, you have a, you have a integral of, of the, you, you have curvature. And then what you can do is you can take particular two parameters in space of shapes and define curvature along this surface and integrate it. But the problem is that the space of shape of the infinite dimensional, there is no really like, like, like overall integral. That's the first thing. And secondly, it's infinite dimensional, not two dimensional. So you cannot really integrate, re integrate it easily. So there is no uh, direct analog, but you can invent some, for example, this way. Let's assume that you have uh, some reduced uh, shape space. Well, for example, let's take me, and I'm allowed only to, to, uh, uh, to do the following. I'm allowed to do this, and I'm allowed to do this. Okay? Then I claim that if you suspend me in space by doing this and this, I can actually rotate. So in particular, you have to make you have these two parameters. You can take you can take the plot with, with two parameters: the angle of, of my uh, hand, uh, arm here and the angle of my arm here, two angles. And in this, in this uh, surface, which is parameterized by these two angles, you can uh, define curvature and integrate it. And and this, I don't know what what is going to be. I think it will be problem. Because in this case, it's, in some sense, it's complicated that the one for whole effect. Because when you do closed loop, you will have actually three angles. So the whole matrix of rotation rather than just one number is before. So when you integrate, you will get some matrix. You have to take trace of this matrix. Probably you will get zero, I might guess. I actually don't know. A good question. But, but it's, it's, it's a little bit different. First of all, it's, it's non-compact space. And secondly, it's, it's actually uh, matrix value. It's not. It will be characterized by integers. Right? Say it again. The, the, it will be still. It will still be indexed by integers, right? The, probably not because it's not compact. The, the, the extra conditions that I needed in quantum Hall effect is I had to argue that everything is periodic in fluxes and therefore it's actually equal to integer number. But, but I actually I don't know much of this, so you can it can be it can be studied, I guess. When you showed the plot of Hall resistivity against the magnetic field, mm -hmm. and the uh, matter of interest was the plateau that we had for a range of B, yeah, uh, uh, like even the longitudinal, longitudinal resistivity, they display some interesting characters. Like they are valid as at zero. So what can that mean? Right, right. So. Exactly at the places where you have plateau here, you have zero of, uh, of the longitudinal resistivity. And this is actually sometimes even better signal 
for plateau. Plateau can be not really clearly seen, but this is usually better, so people look at this. What this means in this particular case is that the electrons form some incompressible state. At, at this. So you have to think about this as, as many body state of electrons. There are a huge number of electrons in magnetic field. In magnetic field, energy levels are quantized, and you fill those energy levels with electrons. And at some particular filling factors of those levels, those levels can hold a lot of electrons, you fill them by one third, and then you get this plateau at one third. Uh, this one at one third. So, um, so they form some special state which is incompressible state, which is very rigid state. So it's fluid, but it's like water rather than like air. Air can compress, water is hardly compressible. So, so basically, yeah, this is what it means. That that's basically at this point, this, the, the electrons form incompressible states. That's the physical meaning of this. Thank you. Okay, I think that we should close it here. Let's thanks Sasha once more. Thank you. <laughs>